three psych tests, one to uh, become a, a law enforcement officer for the first time, one to lateral to the second department that I worked at, and then one to get on the SWAT team. Same 300 some odd question test, same crackpot psychologist uh, who interviewed me, did the same techniques. It was kind of weird because like by the third time there I would answer a question and he would say stuff about my background and stuff that had we hadn't talked about in that session maybe two sessions ago or whatever. Anyway, the point being that in the 300 question test there was several questions about, you know, phrased differently. Fire fascinates me. I am fascinated by fire. And well, having been a firefighter previous to that, and of course the fire is fascinating. <laughs> you know, I'm not a pyromaniac. Am I going to burn the world down? But the answer yes. Fire does fascinate me. So, the candle. Yes, the candle. It is Advent season, the season of remembering the first coming of Christ as a human baby and also looking forward to the second coming of Christ in the future. And the, there's four weeks of Advent uh, season. This is the first Sunday in Advent. And the first week, the theme is hope. Hope. And purple is the color, as you can tell. Because Christ came in the past, we have hope for his return in the near future. And I say near future because it's always the near future because Jesus wants his followers to be ready at any time. Uh, we don't know when he will return. It might be tomorrow, it might be 2,000 years from now to us. But God is beyond and, and outside of time. Time doesn't mean the same thing to God as it does to us. In fact, Peter, one of the things we can't understand that he wrote, uh, you know, said, for a day to the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So for us, you know, we have this time, and time marches on, and it seems like it gets faster the older you get. And, uh, you know, when you're younger and in school, the day seems to drag on forever, but, you know, time doesn't have that meaning for God. For, for him, it's like looking at a, a wall tapestry or, you know, wall hanging or a Tapestry is probably the best because there's threads and they can be reworked and that happens. But he's looking at the entire history of the world from let there be light to new heavens and new earth. And he can see it all. And, and as it's for us happened, is going to happen, is happening, to him it just is. I mean, he, he sees this all. We might be somewhere in the middle of it. We might be near the end of this tapestry, but God stands outside at seeing the whole thing, and that's one of the mysteries as we celebrate an Advent. God, who was perfectly content and complete within himself. I mean, God was, is, always has been God, and didn't need anything, didn't want anything, so this being who created and sustains everything that we know in the universe decided to enter into that creation and be a part of it. That's what we celebrate at Advent. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1.14, that's what we're looking at today. So Jesus Christ is the eternal God who became flesh and lived among men. He is fully human and fully God. When we look at John chapter 1, verse 14, it's the most concise biblical statement of the Incarnation, and therefore it's one of Scripture's most significant verses. The four words with which it begins, the Word became flesh, expresses the reality that in the Incarnation, God took on humanity. The infinite became the finite. Eternity entered into time. The invisible became visible. The Creator entered His creation. God revealed Himself to man in various ways. In creation, Romans chapter 1 expresses that. Like, you look around at creation, at the sky, the stars, the sun, the moon, the trees, the birds, the animals, the earth, the sea. You look at these things and it just screams out that there is a Creator. But God also revealed Himself in the Old Testament through the Scriptures. And then, of course, he revealed himself in, in himself, in Jesus Christ, the one and only Son. And we have the record of his life and work and what that means for us, 
what that means for the past, what that means for the future, through the New Testament. So when we look at John chapter 1, verse 14, which I'll read here in a moment, we see some things about Jesus' first coming. Father God, thank you for showing yourself to us. As I said, in creation, in your word, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And even now, as we see lives changed by the good news about Jesus coming and living a perfect, sinless life and dying on the cross in our place for our sins, being raised from the dead, and his promise to return, that which we look forward to. Help us today, Lord, as we look at this one verse and all it contains to appreciate, to celebrate, to understand your love for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So it is easy, hopefully, to remember the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, but there's more. It says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, the first 18 verses of John is called the prologue, and it uh, basically lays out all the themes, the things that he's going to talk about in his whole gospel. Light and dark, life and death, Jesus, God, etc. But we're looking at verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, that's the first thing that we see, that the Creator God became part of his creation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, as you know, translating from an ancient actually dead language of Greek uh, into English makes it somewhat difficult. The first readers would have read and understand these things. We say word and what comes into your mind? Probably the written word, right? Maybe the spoken word. Maybe the song, Word Up, by Cameo from the 80s. Maybe not. Maybe some of you weren't born then. But to them, the word is logos, or logos, which we get the word logo, which, you know, maybe you have on your shirt or some other place. Certainly we have different logos. But the word logos means speech or reason, but it also means the word of God. And, of course, it speaks of Jesus Christ, the personal wisdom and power and union with God. So it has this deeper meaning than just the word, a written word. It means uh, the person or the thing that is the minister and creation of government, in government, <laughs> creation and government of the universe. He's the cause of all life, physical and ethical, in the thing. So it's in the world, it's like, it's more than just the word. A Greek philosopher, Heraclitus, first used the term around 600 BC, and he used it to designate the divine reason or plan which coordinates a changing universe. So he looked around and sees the sun comes up, the sun goes down, the moon changes the way it looks. Sometimes I see all of it, sometimes I see none of it. The seasons change, the winds change, the weather change. Here's all this stuff going on, and it all works together. And it works together because of the Logos, the Word. So that's the Word that John is talking about. He's talking about Jesus as the Word that creates and sustains everything. Became flesh. Sarks is that word. It can mean the flesh of your body, skin and bones, blood, muscles, etc. But it means that you're born. Parents came together, you were born of natural generation. You weren't just created out of nothing, uh, but you were born. You're a living creature. You possess a body of flesh, man or beast. But it also denotes human nature, our earthly nature of man, uh, therefore prone to sin and opposed to God. Of course, that part Jesus did not put on, but he put on flesh, became flesh, lived among us as a human. And that, you know, I don't even think spending eternity in heaven with God I will ever be able to understand. 
why God would not only enter into his creation, but enter into it as the most helpless, selfish creature there is, which is a human baby. But he did. Dwelt among us to fix one's tabernacle. You guys have a tabernacle? I uh, thank you for asking. I have a couple in my garage, actually. Tabernacle is a tent. It's a dwelling place. So the tabernacle is the place where God himself said to the people, the Israelites, when he brought them out of Egypt, build me this tabernacle, this big tent. This is where I will dwell or live among you. So the word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacle lived among us. He became flesh. He changed his property, entered into a new condition, became something that it was not before. So God was inv invisible, spiritual, became flesh, changed, entered into creation, and dwelt among us. That saying that he became flesh is a direct argument against some false teaching that was going on at the time. Docetism, perhaps you've heard of it, maybe not. Basically saying, uh, docetism says that flesh, the earth, the material is evil. Therefore, God who is good cannot be evil, but only spiritual. So Jesus could not have been flesh because he is good. He was just appeared to be flesh. Well, you recognize the problem with that. If he just appeared to be flesh, then he just appeared to hang on the cross. He just appeared to die for our sins. He just appeared to be raised from the dead. And none of that actually happened, which means we would still be lost. So John is saying, no, he became flesh. He became a human being. He entered into creation, lived that perfect sinless life, and laid down that life, was killed in reality, died, was raised from the dead in reality. The Word became flesh and lived among us. Now there's all kinds of things in the Bible that uh, warn about these kinds of false teachings, the deceiver, and it is the deceiver and the Antichrist who confesses not that he has come in the flesh. That's in 2 John. John's really big on this throughout all of his writings, right? The teaching here in the prologue identifies Jesus with the Word. Again, the Word became flesh, and that was necessary to combat these false teachings. Throughout John's Gospel, he talks about Jesus being human, true humanity, fully human. We see that he's represented as tired and thirsty in John chapter 4 and chapter 19. Uh, his emotion of spirit is expressed in his voice. He wept. His spirit was troubled in the anticipation of his passion and his flesh and blood in John chapter 6 as well as blood and water at the crucifixion scene. When he hung on the cross, he was bleeding, a spear was stabbed into his side, and blood and water came out. And the nurses can explain to you the anatomy and physiology of that, but basically it means he was human, and he was dead. John writes with this purpose of proving that Jesus is flesh. And he made his dwelling among us, right? pitched his tabernacle, his tent, like I said, just like in Exodus, where God said, I'm going to be dwelling among you. The tabernacle, the word became flesh and tabernacle among us. We get to see that God entered into his creation and lived among it. <clears throat> Jesus came, he was with his disciples, he taught them, he showed the world who he was, God with his people, and then he left. But he didn't leave us alone, didn't leave his first disciples alone. He said, I'm going to send the helper, the 
Holy Spirit to be with you. And since that time, true believers have had the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of them. So God is still with us, just as Jesus was with the first disciples. So what we see in that word became flesh and dwelt among us is that God cares enough about his creation. At that perfect time when things were perfectly set up for the gospel to spread, for uh, people to believe, he entered into that creation. God came into the creation that he created, that he loves, to be with his creation, to share in the human experience, but also showing us the divine. And now God is always with us, and the Incarnation shows that truth most completely, that God would be with his creation, and the Holy Spirit dwells among us. This is what we get to see in Advent. The second thing is that God, the Son, uniquely shows us God. As it says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son, as of the only Son, from the Father. Um, you may see one and only Son in translations. We'll get to that. Glory reveals God's character. It is uh, the opinion, the judgment of someone, whether good or bad. It, it is who someone is. And so in God, it's honor, glory, majesty, and certainly the kingly majesty of the Messiah, Jesus full of grace and truth, which we'll get to in a second. Exodus. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. If you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus 33. Genesis, Exodus. Excuse me, Exodus 33, uh, 17, the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But... He said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Show me your glory, Lord. He said, you can't see my face, but I'll show you my glory. Well then, when Jesus came, we get to see the face of God. And then down in Exodus 34, <coughs> chapter, yes, chapter 34, verse 5, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord. And, and probably in your Bibles too it says Lord, but it's all in lower caps, which means that it's the name of God. Yahweh, Yahweh, we believe it's pronounced. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. That is the glory which the Word showed us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Steadfast love, faithfulness, mercy, glory, the only Son of the Father. Now, <clears throat> some people will say, false teachers through the centuries, that 
monogenes means only begotten, right? Uh, does not imply that Jesus was created by God and thus not eternal. That's what they're saying. Well, he is the only begotten son. That means that God created him. He's not really God. No, that's not the truth. Of course, we know that begotten means that someone created or uh, somehow made that thing. But it doesn't just return, refer to that origin, but specialness, uniqueness, if you will. Isaac was Abraham's monogenes. <sighs> what does that mean? Well, if you know Abraham's story, was Isaac his first son? No, no. Abraham and Sarah couldn't have a kid, so Sarah said, take my servant Hagar and have a son. He had that son, and then he had Isaac, the son of the promise, and then when Sarah died, he had more sons. But Isaac was one of a kind in that through him, God's promises would be fulfilled. And so in the same way, Jesus is uniquely one of a kind. He is not begotten in the sense of procreation, but in the fact that he is fully God and fully man. He is God, the second of the three persons of the Godhead. And he came and it was uniquely able to show us God's glory. He is the unique Son of God. And of course, we as children of God are sons and daughters of God, but in a different sense than that. We are all unique creations. Isn't that crazy? Like even identical twins. There's differences in the identical twins because we are all unique, all knit together in our mother's womb by God. We all have personalities, physical attributes, emotions, purposes in life that are unique. We are all unique creations who show our lineage and upbringing. You look at me, you can see my father. You look at my son, you can see me. And yet Jesus is the only son who shows us the father in the same way that we can see our backgrounds. We see God, the father through Jesus. And the final thing, God's grace shows us the truth because he says that glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Grace is that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness, grace of speech, goodwill, loving kindness, favor. Grace is that which we receive that we do not deserve. It is unmerited favor from God. And truth, what is true in any manner under consideration, not subjectively, objectively. So there is an absolute truth, no matter what people may say nowadays. Subjectively, that's like our opinion of truth, personal excellence, the truth of mind which is free from affection, pretense, simulation, falsehood, and deceit. I mean, we can say we know what truth is, right? It's what's not false. Jesus showed these divine attributes of grace and truth, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, Colossians 2, 9. And the things most connected with that salvation are grace and truth. So Jesus shows us by grace the truth that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that he is the Savior sent by God to live the perfect sinless life, to lay down that life on the cross in our place for our sins. That is the truth. We don't deserve to know that. We don't deserve salvation, we don't deserve God's love, and yet he gives us. And this is what Advent and the incarnation of Christ shows us. God's grace and truth. So Advent celebrates Jesus' first coming. That's called the incarnation. Modern society calls it Christmas, the birth of Jesus. But it is God coming to be amongst his creation. God in the person of Jesus Christ entered creation to show us God, God the Father, and to reveal by grace the truth of God and salvation through Jesus Christ alone. 
We can also look forward to his return, where all those who have believed will be with him forever in eternity in heaven. And all the injustices and all the evil and all the terrible things in the world will be fixed, righted, as justice will be poured out. So during this season, sure we get presents, sure we get cookies, sure we get lights and trees, but most of all we get to remember that God cared enough to come and show, him, show us himself and that he will return again. And that's what we look forward to. So let's pray. Father, thank you for, again, this day. Thank you, Jesus, for your love, for leaving heaven to come to earth, for doing what you did here, and for promising to come back. Give us patience until that time. Pour out your grace and your love upon us. And help us to tell others during this time all about you, all about the Father, and all about your love. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray in your name. Amen.